going here. I would like to introduce ourselves, my colleague Mike Doy, and I am Chris Meyer. We, we are both teaching at York Mills, and we would like to share with you today our journey as teachers, our story of how we learn to teach better. So let's begin by the important question, driving us to teach better. We saw a bit about this this morning from Dr. Bonnie Schmidt's keynote address. Lots of people are identifying weaknesses or flaws in our educational system. And if certain pundits are cluing into this, then these, these uh, weaknesses are perhaps large. We've identified that very few of our students make it through the system into a final STEM career. And this has consequences <coughs> for the success of our future economy and the general happiness of our students down the road. <coughs> there are international lobby organizations formed by tech companies, in this case here, who are asking us to teach differently, to introduce other sets of skills beyond just science content in our classrooms. They identify crucial skills to the workplace, such as critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity that they want our students imbued with. And Dr. Bonnie Smith stole part of my talk here, which I stole from her. <laughs> and the, the research results of her organization about future careers within Canada and how a majority of them have a very strong STEM component to them. Either full STEM careers or are definitely informed by a good STEM education. So it looks like the future that our students face is very tightly woven with STEM ideas. And we want to help them be as successful as possible in that future. Yeah, come on in, grab a seat. Now, in the baskets at your tables, uh, these are baskets that we have in our classrooms, you'll find some multiple choice letters. Please grab a set of letters for yourself. Hi, come on in. More space over here. All right. This is our This is our five dollar classroom response system that we use instead of clickers. You'll find many fewer technological headaches with these and much more generally effective and useful. So I have a few questions for you that we will start things off with. First of all, what subject do you primarily teach? I want to get to know you a little bit in a quick and easy way. Like mass speed dating. More A's in this session. Still a good smattering of B. Yeah, yeah. So people are showing B, C. Good, good. good. So thank you very much. So it looks like the A's are winning. Lots of B's and then just a couple of C's. But I, I hope that the C people find that there, there's actually a lot that you can get out of this presentation. I was hoping to see more of the, the math folks here at our STEM conference. <laughs> and second question, how much non-lecture inquiry teaching have you tried? Great, thank you very much. So there's quite a cross-section. There's a few people identifying lots, which is great. We are local experts here. And the majority um, responding B. So you're trying this stuff out, and I guess you're here to learn a little bit more. And then hopefully for those of you who are fairly new to it, you find a good uh, introduction to it through our presentation. So on to our story. So I want to spend a few minutes describing the process that we have gone through over a number of years to, to get where we are today. And that begins with our toes, dipping our toes into the inquiry water. Uh, this was something that I began to learn about uh, about, about 10 years ago. And at that time I discovered STEM education research. And I began experimenting in my classroom with elements of inquiry-based instruction. So just trying out little bits, 
hesitant, dipping my toes in the water. So I did that for a while. And then... <laughs> That's your vacation. <laughs> and then I went to oh, York so Mills. Cool. <laughs> I went to York Mills. That's where I met Mike. And shortly thereafter, we decided, you know, we like the ideas of inquiry-based learning, and so we want to completely transform our course and make it entirely inquiry-based. So we're just going to jump in the deep end. And it, it actually went better than this picture may suggest. But. Uh, it's a, it was a brand new teaching world for us, so we felt that sort of sense of hesitancy and reluctance when we're beginning. We don't really know what we're jumping into. <coughs> but later on, 2013, you can see we're now uh, elite divers, very happy to jump into this pool. We began uh, adapting our inquiry-based ideas from our physics programs into our grade 10 science course, and more recently into our grade 11 chemistry course which at this point is now almost entirely inquiry-based. So it's been an evolutionary process going from dabbling and trying things out to that point where we realized now we have to jump in. And along with that has come a very important change in perspective in the way that we teach and approach the task of teaching. Uh, such a tasty treat. Chocolate on top and the peanut butter underneath. And in my mind, the chocolate is the science, especially delicious. But, of course, very important for our careers is the tasty layer of peanut butter underneath, the teaching. And when you combine the chocolate and the peanut butter, for many years, I had thought that you get teaching science. That's what I did for uh, about a decade. But part of this transformational process was for us to figure out that when we combine these together, we shouldn't think of it as just teaching science anymore. We should really think of it as scientific teaching. And I apologize for our vertically challenged screen here. <laughs> as, especially as scientists ourselves, or people who have a background in scientific training, when we think about the combination of science plus education, we should really think of this as a scientific problem and use the tools and techniques that we have learned in our scientific training. And especially, use the idea of the engineering design cycle to help us become better teachers. So we began a process of researching into how students learn. We want to understand what goes on in their heads. Based on that, we could design our new lessons, our inquiry-based lessons. We would try out those lessons, and then, as best we can, analyze the results qualitatively or quantitatively and try to decide, make a judgment on its effectiveness. Research, adjust, and the cycle continues every time, improving the way that we teach, but approaching it the way a scientist or an engineer would. And an important guide for us is the vast body of education research which is present nowadays. And this is a recent study that came out it was back in 2014 showing that active learning, so basically anything except lecturing, anything aside from lecturing, helps students in all STEM disciplines. At this point the research is extremely robust. And so they show in that study that in all their experiments where they use active learning, the vast majority produce a significant drop in the failure rates of those courses. And if you take a look at how those students do on specialized educational tests or on their traditional exams, in each of these STEM disciplines, these students are performing better. And that's what this data here is a measurement of, from physics, math, chemistry, biology, across the field. So the ideas of active learning, and especially inquiry-based learning, have proven to be extremely successful, according to the education research. <clears throat> we have our own data at York Mills. So using some standardized tests that are well-researched in terms of their efficacy, we have measured how our grade 11 physics students perform before 
we changed the way we teach. So they're scoring 53% on this particular test. And now they're scoring 60% on this particular test after we changed to fully inquiry-based learning. And educationally speaking, that is a statistically significant effect of a pretty decent size. If you have questions about the stats later, I'd love to talk about it. <laughs> and now I would like to share with you uh, a snapshot of our classes. So you've seen a bit of rationale there. But what happens when you take that education research and you try to do something with it? Well, the end result looks something like this. Our classes, you will, you will notice here, are all based on cooperative group work. Students learn better when they work together in groups. <coughs> the research tells us that lecturing is very inefficient at promoting understanding. At this point, there's no doubt to that conclusion. And so the solution are guided inquiry activities where the students are working collaboratively and trying to build their own understanding of the scientific concepts. The research shows us that students routinely memorize the content without any understanding behind it. I'm sure you've discovered that on many occasions in your own teaching. So our solution is, in our classes, students have to routinely explain their ideas to one another. They're constantly discussing, talking, sharing their ideas. And that helps to reinforce this deeper understanding and background behind these topics. Yes, sir. Would showing videos and small clips count as lecturing? Is that still... I, I would say it depends on how you use it. Um, we still show some videos and clips, but we tend to uh, break it up. We tend to organize discussion around it so that students are much more mentally engaged with the material. Nothing like obvious little half hour, hour videos, but like five minute, three minute YouTube clips about a concept. Of they, they can be used very effectively. Uh, technology. Technology helps us to see patterns in the scientific world. This is how researchers use technology. And so in our classrooms, we use it in a very targeted way and largely to help students confirm their understanding of something. Certainly not as a crutch or a gimmick. <clears throat> the research tells us that in order for students to mentally progress and build their understanding, they have to have regular targeted feedback. It can't be feedback once per test or once per quiz. You have to be getting feedback from each student as regularly as possible. And so there's many ways that we do that in our class, one of which we've already tried out together today. Research tells us students learn isolated facts. There's, there are the, these little islands of knowledge in their mind that have very few connections between them. So to promote those connections, students need to learn based on concrete observations, possible. They need to build up the understanding themselves from their basic or prior ideas. And then the connections form as part of their learning process. They tend toward very superficial thinking. Once you give them an idea like momentum, their brains will shut off. So when you teach something new, the strategy that we use is introduce the concept first allow them to explore it without our formal framework. Give them a name second and if there's any math, do that last, once the understanding is in place. And finally, it's so important to recognize that students are not blank slates. They're not these empty vessels that we can just pour our knowledge and wisdom into. That knowledge that we try to share with them, that understanding that we hope that they will develop is filtered and interpreted by their life's experiences, by their naive conceptions of scientific ideas. And very often those naive conceptions will win if they're placed against our sophisticated scientific understanding. And so when they learn, they have to become aware 
of what their prior knowledge is. And they have to be challenged to understand the limits of that prior knowledge and the benefits of the new sophisticated ideas that we are trying to teach them. So there's a lot that the education research is telling us about how students learn. And this is a quick overview, a too quick overview, of how we try to make use of this. But now to try to put this into a different context, we would like to go through a sample lesson with you from our grade 10 optics course. And this is where I hand things over to Mike. We'll lead you through this part. Take a look, pass it back, please. So what I'm passing out here is a lesson uh, from our grade uh, 10 optics unit. Uh, where this fits in, uh, my unit is approximately 17 days long. Uh, we start off looking at light, then we look at reflection with plane mirrors, curved mirrors, and then we get into refraction. And so this would be the, the second lesson in refraction. So they've already had an introductory lesson to refraction. So they've already learned a little bit about angle of incidence, angle of refraction. They definitely know about the normal from everything that they've done so far. And so now we're starting to get into, uh, into things a little bit more deeply. Um, and then they'll lead in, uh, this leads into uh, a formal lab that we do through, uh, during the unit and then into lenses and then we wrap up the unit. Uh, what I'd like you to do is take a look there, and we saw uh, many people were have, are familiar with the junior level uh, courses, so maybe you've seen optics, you've taught optics. Uh, if there's somebody that's in your group that has taught optics, you know, maybe you want to take on the leadership role and you know, maybe walk people through. If you've never taught the material before, the stuff that you need to conduct this lesson is actually at the back. We have the ray box and we have the semicircular blocks. And so feel free to go up as a group and play with it and actually work through this lesson. And that's what I'd like to spend the next uh, about maybe 10 minutes or so, is give you time to read through this lesson. You know, take a look at, uh, take a look at its strengths. If you have any suggestions, discuss them in your group, discuss them with me. The second part, the second sheet that I'm going to hand out to you is meant to go along with it. And it's really more what we're here for today is kind of deconstructing that lesson and taking a look at its strengths and weaknesses um, and getting you to pick apart what the students are actually doing as they're working through this lesson. Because it can be very easy to interpret the way that we have set up our inquiry-based lessons as simply worksheets that they work through. And they work and they get them done. And, you know, that does happen. There will be students that complete these just for the sake of completing them. But we do find that when we're giving these lessons out, these inquiry-based lessons, students are more engaged with the material, they're doing hands-on stuff, and they're more, at, more regularly going to be figuring things out as opposed to just completing it for the sake of completing it. So, uh, please take the next, next 10 minutes or so working in your groups, and I got one more comment on groups, but uh, read through the lesson in its entirety, discuss it, and then start on working through the companion sheet that kind of goes along to analyze that. Something else that we do in class. Now, Chris already uh, demonstrated one thing with the response cards, but another thing that we do to complement our teaching style of small collaborative group learning is we clearly define group roles. This will take place at the beginning of the course. And, you know, they've seen it, by the time they get to grade 12 physics, they've seen it in grade 11 physics, grade 11 chemistry, and grade 10 science. So they're, they're well trained in this idea of working in effective groups. So what we do for them is we talk about the roles of what makes a group a strong group. For starters, you need a leader. You need a manager. You need to, somebody that's going to keep everybody focused. Make sure that people are not on their cell phones. People are not always constantly excusing themselves to go to the bathroom, to go talk to people in another group. That their minds are on the task at hand. The second role that uh, we often have them doing is a recorder. And this comes with, uh, this complements the feedback portion of things. So the recorder, it's their job to make sure that everything ends up on their sheet, but it's the manager's job to make sure that it ends up on everybody's sheet. The recorder would also complete any whiteboard work. You see the whiteboards in front of you? Those are regularly used in class. If anything ends up on the whiteboard, that's probably going to be a point where we all come back together as a class and share our you know, our interpretation, our understanding with the class. 
Um, something else for the recorder, though, that fits into the feedback aspect of things is you have now in front of you a typical lesson that would be covered in approximately one day. Uh, I would randomly select, you know, every day or so, I would randomly select one or two groups. I would collect all their work. So the group of three members would staple all their work together with the recorder's copy on top. And that's the one that I'm going to go through in fine detail, give constructive feedback, maybe steer them in, uh, in the right direction, and they would get that back and they would be able to go through it with their group members. I would flip to the other group members' sheets and make sure that they're complete and they have the right ideas down. But, you know, if it's a little bit messy or if it's, you know, maybe incomplete sentences or something like that, I'm not going to worry about it. But the recorder's copy is the one that is meant to be, you know, submitted for evaluation. And then the final role is the speaker. Now, I talked a little bit about the use of the whiteboards. The recorder might fill out the whiteboard. But then the speaker would be responsible for sharing the results with the class. And we will be doing a little bit of that today. You'll notice that on the companion sheet, there is parts where it says, you know, do this work on your whiteboard, and then we will come back together to discuss that. Uh, so I think that's about it. I'd like to give you guys the next 10 minutes or so to read through the lesson and also working with the companion. And for those of you that have never seen the optics unit before, I encourage you to head back to the back and play with the uh, ray boxes and look at what it means for refraction going from a slow medium to a fast or from a fast medium to a slow. Some of the terms that the students would know before starting this lesson. Okay. So please put yourselves in the groups of three or four ideally. Yeah. And then go through the materials. And assign your role.